Hi, and welcome to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And welcome to the third and final model or typology that we're going to be covering in this series of different personality typologies. Now, this particular podcast is going to be on... Um, it's a system that I'm going to call more of a model than a typology. Uh, typologies can be considered relatively static. Um, you're one type, you grow within that type, but that's pretty much where you're at. But this is more of a um, this is more of a fluid model. This is not you know you're just this one type and that's where you stay. Uh, this is a vertical model, which means that we move through this model. Yeah, if you're following along, a couple podcasts ago we talked about the difference between vertical models and horizontal models. Horizontal models assume everyone's at the same level of development and you're comparing and contrasting kind of your definition or your distinction on that level of development. Whereas this is a vertical model, which is not assuming that everyone's at the same level of development. Some people are further along in their individual development than other people. Now again, this doesn't mean someone's better or worse than anyone else. It just means that as an individual, you're further along in your development. So, and I use the example of the archer versus the golfer. One is defined as an archer, someone who shoots bow and arrow, and the other is a golfer, someone who hits golf balls and plays the game of golf. They can both be at different levels of development in their skill set and their game, and neither one is better or worse. They're being compared individually to how they're interacting on their particular sport. And so that's what we're talking about today is this vertical model. So this model is called the Graves model. And to give a little bit of context in history, it was developed by a professor of psychology named Claire Graves. Now, Claire Graves was a contemporary of Abraham Maslow, whose name you might recognize from the very famous um, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Abraham Maslow was a leader in the human potential movement back in the 60s, and Claire Graves was a bud of his. They were friends. Now, the story as I've heard it, so I don't know if this is empirically true, <laughs> but this is how I heard the story go down. Uh, after studying Abraham's um, Abraham Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, Claire Graves asked the question, what does self-actualization mean? Now, if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and if you're not, Google it right now, and you'll find a pyramid that has five different levels that talk about different phases or stages or needs that we have that build upon each other. At the bottom, you have survival. Then you have uh, that builds on top of that safety and security. Then on top of that, you have love and belongingness. On top of that, you have self-esteem. And then on top of that, you have self-actualization. And I believe that we referenced Maslow in a previous podcast. Um, so please feel free to listen to that podcast because we're not really going to focus on Maslow too much. We are going to talk about, though, that final need of self-actualization and Claire Graves' question, what happens when we self-actualize? Again, this is the story as I've heard it. I don't know if this is empirically true, but this is sort of the mythos that has surrounded how Claire Graves came up with the Graves model. So what he did is he did a study of people asking them the same question over the course of many years. And that question was, how do you define a healthy person? Because he wanted to get sort of people at various levels of where they're at in their life. And he asked them, the same people, same handful of people, over, I think it was the course of like 50 years, mm -hmm. the same question every few years. How would you define a healthy person? And he noticed that their, their answers didn't always change. Sometimes they defined a healthy person the exact same way that they had defined them about three years before. However, he noticed that when they changed, they changed in a predictable pattern. The reason why he asked, how do you define a healthy person is because that is going to be our highest level of personal development. We're going to describe a healthy person at our highest level of personal development. And so when people's answers change, they, they change in a predictable pattern, indicating that people were going through various levels of growth and development by altering how they define that healthy person, right? The yeah. healthy person started to change and it changed in a predictable pattern. So uh, he recorded this. He recorded this pattern. He saw a model emerging. Now, what's really fascinating about, excuse me, uh, Claire Graves' model is that he recognized that not only did it work on a micro level, mm. meaning for individuals, but there was a mirroring of how societies learn and grow, like the levels of development that they go through on a macro level. So 
these levels of development aren't just for us as individuals. They also mirror the experience of whole societies and um, you know, vice versa. So on a micro level, we mirror societies and on a macro level, societies mirror individuals. Now what's really, really cool about this model, one of the reasons why I find it so fascinating I mean, I find it fascinating for a lot of different reasons. But one of the things that I find super fascinating is that we as individuals, we are more, uh, we are more, I don't want to use the word fluid. Um, We're more mobile than whole societies, right? It's like, it's like a speedboat versus a, you know, the Titanic. We're more dynamic because we can turn on a dime. We can grow much faster than a whole group of people, a collective can. Exactly. So if you can sort of trace the developmental levels of people who are at the very highest levels of development right now, like the mavens, the ones who are really like, you know, uh, sort of at the forefront of growth, you can predict where entire societies are going, Hmm. right? Because societies haven't caught up to the people who are at the highest levels yet. Those individuals, like you said, they're a lot more dynamic. They can get a lot further than entire society can. So now if we start studying individual levels of development, we can start predicting where entire societies are going. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, the, I, I always had this question, and when, the Gra- when I learned the Gray's model, it answered it for me. It was so eye-opening. But I would look at the history of Europe, for example. And for years, for years, you know, the countries in Europe were at war with each other and it kind of culminated in World War II and then the Cold War. But France and England aren't aren't going and attacking each other anymore, you know, after all these years. like Yeah, for a thousand years, they were like at each other's throat every exactly. seven years. And warfare. And now France and England, obviously, well, I mean, they get along at least on paper and, you know, in the open. But they're getting along and, the, and European countries are getting along. And why? Why were they at war for so long and now they're not? What has happened in Europe that has changed this? And I would always ask myself this, you know, and then there's other other uh, continents where there still is warfare very similar to what that was a thousand years ago. So what's going on here? Like, why is why is Europe now settled down and they're all civil with each other? But a thousand years ago, you know, they were at each other's throats. What What's happening there? Yeah, well, and it's, you know, to give a sneak peek of that macro micro thing. Why does a teenager fight their parents every day? Yeah. And then all of a sudden they suddenly grow up and go get a job and become responsible and they're not fighting with their parents anymore. And then they become the parents someday. Yeah. <laughs> and their teenagers fighting with them. <laughs> right. So we we can see how we do go through these levels of development as we age. Mm-hmm. And it's really exciting to be able to chart these levels out because it gives us an idea of where we as individuals are heading as well as where societies are heading. It gives us sort of a master map for where we're going to go next, which is awesome. Not only that, but... It also gives us an inside look into why people can't seem to communicate with each other if they're at different developmental levels. One of the major pieces of this is that we can't see a level beyond where we're we're currently at, right? Because we haven't got there. We don't know what we don't know. So when somebody's at a level that it's actually higher than us developmentally, we have a tendency to see them as behind us developmentally because they'll have markers that feel familiar to us but they're not anything we've ever experienced and so on some levels they don't seem like we were in the past but on other levels they do and so we project onto them we project onto them an immaturity that they may or may not possess right we actually might be the immature ones in comparison to them but that just explains so much you know communication breakdown and why we might you know, really feel like the other person's an idiot when they're, you know, they might not actually be an idiot. Yeah. And then on a macro level, it explains why entire cultures can be at each other's throats for, you know, for a long time, like you mentioned with England and France, why they can be at each other's throats, which kind of, I mean, really, when you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It kind of makes sense, but kind of not, right? Yeah. And so, like, why, why do we have such upheaval in certain parts of the world and other parts of the world are like, hey, just chill out, man. It's not that big of a deal. <laughs> <laughs> right? So there's a lot of things, a lot of components that get explained when seen through the lens of the Graves model. Yeah. And I think, you know, you mentioned the the teenager, the parent, that teenager. I mean, I had this experience as a teenager. I knew everything. Like I, I was at the highest level of development there ever was going to possibly be as a teenager. I knew it all. And mom and dad, you kind of are old school. You don't have a, you don't have it together. And You know, as I grew up into adulthood, I'm like, oh, I've developed now. They had a whole wealth of wisdom and knowledge that I thought was regressive, 
when in fact some of that was progressive beyond where I was. And it was a personal experience moving through those levels. And I'm sure you've had that too, if you've grown through that as a, as a person. Um, and I think the, the real interesting piece is people that get stuck there when their peers and other people have moved on on a micro level. And that's an interesting, fascinating talk as well. And we, we don't get into all that, but that's just so fascinating to me how some people stay at certain levels. They never progress beyond that well into adulthood right. on the micro level. Yeah. Oh, that is interesting when other people progress and you haven't. And then the other is just as interesting when you start <laughs> progressing and everybody around you is not. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're the odd man out. And it's really fascinating to see how when somebody stays at a certain level of development um, and somebody else moves beyond, how much crap they'll give that person oh, yeah. <laughs> for moving beyond them. Yeah. When they don't realize the person's moving beyond, again, they see it as regressive. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, th- these are just really com- interesting components of the Graves model. And I think uh, unless you have any more that you want to say on let's sort of- Let's get into it. Yeah, let's, let's launch into this model. So uh, if, I mean, you're listening to this on a podcast, so you're probably working out or driving or doing something that really doesn't allow you to get a piece of paper and a pencil. But if you have the capacity to do so, we recommend maybe jotting down a few notes because there's some really interesting components to all of this. Uh, We'll also be putting notes in the podcast notes, um, you know, on our website. So if, you know, if you're working out right now and you can't take any notes and you want to go reference something um, that we've talked about, please feel free to visit personalityhacker.com, go to the podcast section, look for this podcast and then read the podcast notes and uh, and you'll get um, more of a, a sort of a written representation. All right. So that said, basically, uh, if you if you have the ability to write down um, any of these notes, what you do is you take a piece of paper and you um, you ha- leave like a inch and a half margin on the left side and you draw a vertical line going up and down. And then what you want to do every like inch, inch and a half is you'll want to draw a horizontal line going up and you'll want to draw about about seven lines. To create eight, eight horizontal sections, basically. Exactly. <laughs> In the bottom left-hand corner, all right, on the left part of that, lo- that vertical line, sort of that first little box in the bottom left-hand corner, just write a letter one, and then mark the next one above it two, and the next one above it three, and the next one above it four, five, six, seven, eight. You can kind of get, get a drift. So what we'll be doing is we'll be talking about them, these levels numerically. Now, there is a color coding system. And one of the reasons why some people like the color coded system is because it makes it more egalitarian. It makes it so that, you know, none of these levels appear any better or worse than any other level. Whereas, you know, going one through seven, somebody might get the impression that six is, you know, empirically better than two. Yeah. And that's not really the case. People are at different levels of development depending upon their context, their culture, their their circumstances, their age. Right, exactly. So it has nothing to do with better or worse. Uh, so some people color code it. We'll offhandedly mention the, the colors. It's not that big of a deal. But basically, you just want to number it one through eight, starting from the bottom and then going all the way up to the top. All right. And so the first level is um, it's the color is beige and it's called the survival level. Now, if you look at this on a macro level, we evolved this level, sort of Graves 1, right? This, grave, this first level uh, about 150,000 years ago, possibly 200,000 years ago. And this is early man, basically. Uh, This is survival. This is individual survival. This is everything is about me and my personal survival. Uh, It's all about basically me getting my individual needs met, right? Me, 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 my needs, my survival. And that's really where the, the hyper focus is. Uh, In on a micro level as individuals, we see this basically at birth, right? Birth to, you know, about three, maybe four years old. And that's what a baby's life is all about. A baby is all about me and my survival. Um, I've got a (laughs) two-year-old, a toddler, and really this is her world and we just get to live in it, right? And that's basically how the survival graves one sees life, right? Nothing is really different than them. The entire universe is just an extension of themselves, which is a very interesting concept when you think about it in terms of ego transcendence. But there's nothing transcendent about this ego. Everything is about the ego survival because it wants to live, and this is the only way it knows how to do so. Yeah, and if you have a small child or you've been around one, you can totally see this in that it is all about them at every moment. And I think another place you could see this on a micro level, um, and depending on the circumstance, I want to be careful with that caveat, but uh, people who 
potentially are homeless or are kind of they don't ha- they're not plugged into society at all in any sense uh, can also be identified at this level of level one of the survival level where it's really again they they have a little sensitivity to other people because obviously they're interacting they know the English language or a language any country that they live in but they are pretty much about survival at the core fundamental element of what they're focused on. And it's really about their survival. Yeah, even that's rare. Even amongst the homeless, exactly. it's rare to have a, a Graves 1. I would say it's, it's... It's one of the few places you find an adult, I think. Very few. Uh, I mean, I would say probably the better analogy is um, like feral children. Mm. You know, like children who... Uh, and it's very rare that we run into feral children or people who become feral adults, but I would say feral is probably closer. It does happen, though. There are some homeless that are Graves 1, but it's it's pretty rare. So as we go up to the next level, level 2, and if you're following along with colors, it's the color purple. This is the tribal level. So this is more about our survival as a tribe. We start to see this emerge in uh, all sorts of cultures. This came about probably about twenty to 30,000 years ago when this kind of came on the scene on a macro level. And on a micro level, this is where, you know, the toddler is starting to kind of toddle around and identify, oh, mommy and daddy are part of my world. My brother and sister are part of my world. We're all in this together. It's about our survival as a family. It's not just about me. It's also about sharing my toys, sharing my food, give and take on a micro level with my family. And so this tribal element, you know, in in tribal cultures where the tribe of about 100 to 150 people are banded together and they are focused on surviving as a group, uh, taking care of it. It's a very familial uh, feel to it. You have a lot of, you know, tribal elders that make decisions for the tribe. You have a tribal culture. Um, And it's important to be part of that tribe and to not get kicked out of that tribe because that could mean your actual survival is threatened. And so this is about group cohesion, tribal survival, our survival. And so you see this kind of this pattern of where, where level one was my survival, level two is our survival. And, and the, the real question, the real, the real uh, I guess, uh, the real lesson that is learned at this level is the lesson of unconditional acceptance. Whereas I'm part of the family unit, I'm part of the tribal unit, and I'm unconditionally accepted because of my status in this tribe. And that's a lesson that's very key to learn on a micro level in your family. People that learn this lesson you know, have good self-esteem and other things, understand they're accepted and loved. And on a macro level, as a tribe, it's important to have an extended kind of family, extended tribe, and this looks different for different people. But there's some important lessons that are learned at level two. Yeah, and you can see cultures that are still at level two, uh, cultures like um, in Papua New Guinea, um, maybe some uh, different um, countries in, you know, there are African tribes that are still at graves too. And it's and it is very everybody's invited, right? Like if there's a party, everybody's invited. And even if somebody's thoroughly obnoxious, um, you know, they're still they're still invited. There's parts of rural America, yeah, where this happens. I it's mean, true. part in the hills of West Virginia, yeah. where it's kind of this family. You know, every neighbor knows each other, and the whole community comes together. It's very tribal too. You know, kind of feel to it. Yeah. Well, and you can you can see the uh, you can see the impact. I mean, in these tribal cultures, if you are no longer invited to the tribe, I remember somebody talking about when I lived in Alaska, the Inuit, um, uh, some of the Inuit tribes. Uh, they used to call it taking somebody fishing, and that person just wouldn't come back. Yeah. Right. And so there's this this idea of if you're not if you're not acceptable to the tribe, they just take you out. But otherwise, you're totally acceptable. Like, everything about you. And that's why you can see this really starting in families. Like, when children start to develop what's called theory of mind, which is they recognize that other people's minds are thinking differently than theirs are, you can really see that that's, the fe- the, that's really what we're trying to teach our children, is that they are unconditionally accepted. They are unconditionally loved within the family arrangement. Uh, also at this level, you start to see development of, in like spiritual terms, shamanistic type rituals, uh, animism, different ideas on the gods and how they impact us as humans, you know, uh, and you have kind of this this 
mysterious magic thinking that emerges at this level of, you know, if well, if we do this dance, rain might come down onto our crops and make us prosperous. Yeah, there's a there's a magic thinking component here that I think is really fascinating because because the consciousness has extended out beyond just me and my survival, now it's taking in more territory. So now questions are starting to emerge. Like, why does nature work the way that it works? And because there's not enough consciousness or enough territory being taken in so that there's more, you know, there's like a scientific approach to it, it becomes sort of a cause and effect style of thinking. If I, you know, if I use this rain stick, then rain comes, right? Because I use this rain stick and then rain came, so that must be how it works. And then this mythos and these stories get passed down to the next generation. And then the rain stick is how the gods communicate through rain. So um, yeah, there's a very shamanistic magic thinking component that comes in with graves too. And on a micro level, at least in our country, the United States, this is the time period in a child's life, you know, between four to six years old, when they're starting to believe in things like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. They're, they have these kind of magic thinkings around, oh, if I'm good this year, Santa Claus will bring me presents at Christmas time. Kind of this weird magic thinking around their behavior and their code of ethics in the family. And parents use this often to, uh, to, in, you know, to incite good behavior in their children. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So what ends up happening is in the tribe on a macro level, when one or two people start to stand out from the rest of the group, um, maybe they're the fastest runner, maybe they're the best hunter, uh, maybe they're able to gain resource better than anybody else, they begin to uh, get a lot of special attention. Um, The whole tribe starts to look at them as sort of a leader. And when this happens, uh, the next level up begins to emerge in this individual and that's when they get a bump up into graves three or what's called the warlord level now this is this is color coded as red and the warlord level is very interesting this is the time period in history where one person as a standout to the tribe said you know there's a tribe just down the river and they've got a better position than we do, right? They're closer to the river than we are. They've got better resources. Their women are prettier or whatever, right? And why don't we just go take their stuff, right? <laughs> so then this tribe goes and um, uh, declares war on this other tribe, and they just go obliterate them, and then they go, you know, they, they take their captives as slaves, they take their women and rape their women, and they set up shop where the other tribe was, and suddenly now this one tribe is bigger, right? It's taking in more territory, um, and it's all because of this one warlord leader. Now, the reason why the warlord leader is able to do this is because, once again, they get a bump out in how much territory they're seeing. The twos, the greatest twos, are still just seeing within their tribe, right? Like, that's as much vision as they have. But the three starts to see outside of the tribe. They're still part of the tribe, but they're seeing a bigger picture than the twos are. And that's why they're able to take in enough territory to go, you know, there's another tribe. And they're just sitting ducks. So let's go get them. Yeah. So we see this best illustrated in like Genghis Khan. right? And so, you know, if Graves 1 was about 150 to 200,000 years ago, and if, you know, Graves 2 was probably like anywhere between 20 and 50,000 years ago, we're seeing Graves 3 around 10,000 years ago, maybe 15,000, maybe 10 to, yeah, 15 to 20,000 probably. Anyway, basically, uh, when you have that one standout person who has decided that they're going to just go get their stuff, right, Mm -hmm. that other tribe's stuff, and that's the warlord. Now, what's interesting about one, if you notice, is it's very me-centric, my survival. Two was very much about the group, right, our survival. But three goes back to being about me again. It's about me and me going and getting the thing that I want right now. And I might use the twos to go get it, but I want this thing, so I'm going to go get it for me, right? Not really asking, just taking. Just taking, exactly. And uh, what's fascinating about this is that we see a pattern already emerging within the model, which is the odds are about the individual and the evens are about the group. It's about community. So when somebody goes to three and on a micro level and an individual level, this is usually when they're entering into um, the the terrible teens, right? (laughs) The teenage time period. The rebellious years. The rebellious years, right? And that warlord mentality you can really see. You can see that they don't really have a long timeline. Um, This is where a lot of teens like do things like, you know, uh, uh, shoplift right? Um, They get in fights with people for no apparent reason. They've got a lot of ego around themselves. They're just sure that they're right. Um, They're just sure that, you know, that they know everything and everybody else is an idiot. 
But what's really fascinating about threes is that the primary lesson you pick up in three, just like with two, you learned uh, unconditional acceptance. In three, you learn how to put your stake in the ground and stand up for yourself. It's a really important component for all of us to be able to learn how to stand up for ourselves. And you can kind of see when somebody's sort of missed the principle of, of three. You can see when somebody's missed the principle of two. Right. Like yeah. there's a lot of insecurity there. They don't feel that they're, um, you know, unconditionally accepted. There's a lot of sort of wounding that happens in a really bad graves to experience. Like if the family's broken, alcoholic parents or whatever. And three, you can really see when somebody's missed the primary lesson of three because they have a hard time standing up for themselves. They don't really believe that they have any rights. You know, it's not it's not their right to stand up for themselves. It's not their right to ask for what they want. And that's a really important component or the very important lesson of Graves 3. Yeah. And you can see the punishment that has been doled out to threes over the years is, you know, a three, I think, is really because of that that pride, that ego, that wanting to take what's yours. Um, it's You can really hurt a three's pride pr- pretty easily through humiliation, like public humiliation. You look at, you know, back in the early part of, of our country's founding in Boston, you know, people would be put in stocks and have rotten tomatoes and fruit thrown at them as kind of punishment for a crime to kind of humiliate them in public and make them feel bad about what they did. Uh, so this is kind of a way to kind of deal with a three on that level. Um, and it's interesting that there's a lot of pride wrapped up in this. Oh, totally. Well, and you see a lot of threes um, in gangs. Right. In our current cult, um, our society, like in the United States, you see a lot of threes still, you know, surviving in gang mentality, um, gang warfare, uh, teenagers. We've already mentioned, um, you know, there's there's a lot of threes actually in our world. We never see ones. We see two sometimes like, you know, um, I remember a family that I was very familiar with who uh, had 10 children and they all all like almost every single kid in this family lived in the same trailer park. I mean, we're talking adults, right? We're talking like the the parents were in their 60s, 70s. Um, all of their grown children were living in the same trailer park, sort of, you know, sharing three different trailers. And that's as big as their world got was that trailer park and that family. So we do see twos still represented, but they're not as common either. But threes we're starting to see more common in society. We're starting to see them as the ones who are usually, you know, getting in trouble, basically. Uh, hearkening back to what I talked about before, in Europe, you know, hundreds of years ago, you can see that kind of three warlord mentality of this country or this people group going over and attacking this other people group and trying to take resource or claim more land or expand their territory. And different kingdoms were at war with one another, basically interacting with trying to one up each other. And there's basically three societies clashing against each other, trying to reclaim more resource or more territory for themselves. And so there's this upheaval all these political upheavals and this warfare going on in Europe, you know, several hundred years ago because of this type of thing happening. Mm -hmm. So how do we possibly ever graduate to the next level, right? If the next one is going to be an even number, Graves 4, how do we possibly go from, you know, warlord into uh, a community orientation? Well, when a very powerful warlord runs into another very powerful warlord, and they've been doing this for a while, and they clash and they clash and like one, you know, one sometimes gets the better of the other and then the other one gets the better of the other and they're just fighting, 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 fighting. Eventually, they'll realize, look, we are evenly matched here and we're just going to keep fighting. So maybe what we could do is we could write, uh, we could draw a territory line and anything over on this side of the line is yours and anything over on this side of the line is mine and we'll just call it good, right? We'll just... We'll observe the line, we'll honor that line, and you go do your thing and rule your side the way you want to, and I'll rule my side the way that I want to. And that is the birth of Graves 4, which is also, um, the color is blue, and our nickname for this is the civilization level. Now, by the way, tri- you know, survival, tribal, warlord, these are all our nicknames um, that we've kind of picked up from you know different people who have taught this model. And they're the ones that kind of make the most sense to us, so don't... Don't place too much importance on the nicknames that we're giving, but the nicknames are easy for me to remember, and that's why I'm sharing them. So the level four is the blue level, and this is called civilization. So this is when we finally start creating territory boundaries. And what what is one of the first thing that happens with territory boundaries? Rules, right? It's one of the very first things that happen. Laws start getting made. What is acceptable and unacceptable within my territory boundary? 
So four goes back to being about community. If we all live under these rules, we can stop fighting, fighting, fighting constantly. And we can have sort of these contracts between us that allow us to live together without always being at each other's throat. It's a, it's us living together without believing that somebody's going to come in and rob my house. Um, you know, that somebody's just going to come in and take my stuff or rape my, you know, wife or kill my husband or take my children, right? This is this this is the birth of the civilization level. And civilization started about, you know, roughly 5 to 8,000 years ago. Yeah, and you you can see like, you know, being a Roman citizen was important because it gave you a whole bunch, you're a citizen of a civilization that gives you a bunch of rights and privileges, and you had the ability to move freely within a territorial boundary and have those rights honored, you know, by the governments that were set up by the Roman Empire. And so you could see that made commerce easier, that made uh, travel easier, that made a lot of things better for society and they were able to do a lot of great things when these kind of models of civilization started to emerge. They put plumbing in and sewage systems and transportation systems and all this because everyone's on the same page as far as the rules go. Totally. Institutions, the backbone of institutions is Graves 4, is the ability to know that when you start building something, it's not going to immediately be torn down by some warlord that's running through. And because civilization is over the warlord level, because 4 is over 3, 4s generally dominate 3s. Um, you would think that threes would be able to do a bunch of damage even in civilization. And to some extent they can, you know, sometimes they can make their mark. But civilization creates things like militias and armies, right? Now, Genghis Khan had... Police force. Yeah, it, they, uh, Genghis Khan had its army. But, you know, Genghis Khan in comparison to Roman gladiators, right? Like, a, it's just... You've got a bunch of barbarians who are running around and, you know, like not necessarily having now. I, OK, admittedly, I don't know how sophisticated Genghis Khan was with his particular army. Um, but that said, I mean, they must have done a lot of damage. But that said, for the most part, a Graves 4 military operation, uh, no Graves 3 warlord law operation will stand, um, you know, will hold a candle to a well-organized militia. Yeah. And so that's why fours are are good at keeping threes in line. And that's one of the major benefits of a four society. Now, unfortunately, what happens with four is that we gain our identity through the institution that we're in when we are at this level. So we see this on a micro level. We see this like the teenager who's like, you know, screw you, dad, and I'm going to leave and you can't tell me what to do. And then a couple of years later, suddenly they're working at a bank, right? And they're like taking their earring out for their bank teller job or, yeah. you know what I mean? Like suddenly they're like making money and they're, you know, they're kind of the responsible adult that their parents always knew they could be. Yeah. And that's them graduating from Graves 3 into Graves 4. Now, what ends up happening when somebody fully gets into 4 as an individual is they start to massively identify with whatever institution they are now in, whatever Graves 4 institution. So this is where we see the rise of patriotism, right? I'm American. That's so important. Or, you know, like whatever is the country that you're from, like that that's high patriotic sense is a very Graves 4 mentality. Um, this is where we see a lot of uh, very locked down religious concepts come in um, because of course it's all about rules and from the very beginning what is the first what is the first codified law it's that like the law of Hammurabi yeah. that all the other law systems got built upon including most of the the you know the modern day religious systems it's all based on this law code right these covenants these laws these rules and they're very locked down well, that's a very Graves 4 way of going about, um, you know, worship. And you see this in contrast to 2, which was very magic thinking, right? Like the relationship with the gods was very much about like magic thinking. And, um, you know, if we're going to have great crops, we've got to like let our kids, you know, to die on the side of a mountain yeah. <laughs> by freezing to death to make the gods happy. And then, you know, you see a graduation up to 4, which is like, well, the gods don't want us to necessarily sacrifice our children, but they do want us to live this very specific set of rules or the god wants us to do that. And worship in this particular way once a week, mm -hmm. you know, with this institution that kind of organizes this religious experience. Right. And like kind of almost like a one size fits all. Like, yeah. you know, here's your individual expression, but here's how we've framed it for you. And here's how you interact with God or the gods or however you want to go about it in your religious context. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think of uh, sort of the graduation of like leaving your kid, like sacrificing your kid to bail versus 
um, the the really sophisticated sacrifice process that say the early Israelites had, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it's like it's very different, and it's you know like sacrificing sheep is be- definitely better than sacrificing kids, and and you can see that it's gotten more sophisticated, it's gotten more codified. There's more ceremony around it. Yeah, and that's a very graves four concept. Um, ha- and you would think, well, isn't that the top of the development, right? We're in civilization. But the, one of the things about Graves 4 that's very important to remember is that because everything is so codified and we have such an identity wrapped around this institution, one of the mentalities that comes in is my truth versus your truth, right? So the territory is bigger, right? Like we're no longer just seeing our tribe. We're no longer seeing how to get only what we want. We're seeing things on longer timelines. We're seeing relationships between tribes, right? Relationships that create institutions and civilizations. But it's very my truth, right? And I'm identified with my truth. And so actually Graves 4 can be quite bloody. On a macro level, my truth versus your truth I mean, how many wars do we know that's been fought over that, of, over ideology of whose truth is more, you know, is more important? We're still fighting wars on yeah. the planet over things like that. So even though Graves 3 can be pretty bloody because it wants to get what it wants, Graves 4 with its organize, organized militia, with its, you know, like strategy, military strategy can be massively bloody based on a, my truth versus your truth. And most notably, I would say, um, you know, World War II with the bombing of Hiroshima is an example of ideology clashing, Graves 4 ideology clashing, and just instantly millions of deaths. Yeah, um, I can also see Vietnam as one of these, and and really that Cold War experience of the capitalism versus communism, these two major ideological players on the planet for years, kind of positioning themselves and saying, "I'm right and you're wrong." No, no, I'm right and you're wrong, and like it's like this giant chess game for thirty, fifty years, <laughs> right? right? And that Cold War example, and you see a bloody example of that in Vietnam, but that Cold War example this icy coldness of my ideology is right and you're wrong. And unless you come to my ideology, we don't want anything to do with you kind of perspective. Yeah. Um, and that's a real clear example, I think, of two graves for societies kind of being at odds with each other in this. We see a lot of fours in society um, and developed countries. Um, you know, we didn't hardly see any ones. We see some twos. We see more a spattering of threes, but we see a lot of fours, right, in all developed countries. And, uh, and that's very interesting considering that we've already moved into five and leadership is in five. And um, Joel, you want to describe what five looks like? Yeah, and before I do that, I just want to say that at this point, when we get to level four, we're starting to see how uh, people and societies are viewing resource and the ability to hold and use resource. And I think at Graves Four, the mentality is resource is scarce. There's not a lot of resource to go around. So we've got to draw these borders and boundaries. We've got to keep to our own. We've got to really grow our own resource and find new ways to build that resource up because it's scarce. There's not enough for everybody. And we feel kind of anxious and panicked at Graves 4. Oh, that's a gr- uh, thank you so much for mentioning that because that's one of the most profound pieces of 4 is that uh, – we have this concept that resources need to be apportioned very carefully. Yeah. And um, that's, you can kind of see that in like, you know, like the, the grandma who, you know, like squirrels away every nickel. Um, she's still in that very Graves 4 mentality that resource is scarce. And one of the reasons why institutions, Graves 4 institutions even exist is because agriculture came on the scene. Um, agriculture made Graves 4 possible because then we could store food, say, in silos, and then people could start specializing in different components. They didn't all have to be hunters, gatherers. But when farming happens, you know, there's only so much food you can put in a silo. So that's one of the reasons why the carryover of this mentality, um, even though it gives the ab- ability to specialize and have full institutions and create incredible um, infrastructure, is that there's only so much food that we've been able to harvest in the summer through the winter. So we got to make sure that we're conserving. Yeah. And so from, you know, at Graves 2, it was about our survival. And then in the midst of Graves 2, people started to stand out and kind of take leadership. And that moved us into the warlord level. Well, in Graves 4, same thing. We're at a society. We've drawn boundaries. We view resources scarce. We, uh, you know, have these ideologies, my truth versus your truth. And in the midst of that, leaders begin to emerge. And it's a little different than a warlord leader, but there are some patterns here you can see. And at Graves 5, which the color for Graves 5 is orange, if you're following along in colors, 
Yeah, this developed probably about, I'd say maybe 200 to 300 years ago. Oh, not even 300. Maybe, maybe 150, 150 to, 200. to 200 at the most. And, and we're seeing this emergence of leaders who basically now have shifted in how they see resource a little bit. They don't just see resource as scarce. They actually see resource as limitless. And it's something that they can, just like the warlord, kind of go and take through warfare. Graves five leaders see resource as something they can kind of take through manipulation of the current systems and structures that are there. Or not just manipulation, but uh, mastery of those political systems, the political structures. So we find a lot of Graves Five emerging in business, for example, the entrepreneurial class. You know, they no longer punch a time clock at a company. They've gone and started their own company that people now come and punch time clocks for them. So they've developed a way to basically master the system of business where they now are the business owner and they're getting other people to work for them and they've emerged into Graves Five where resource is limitless. They're about, uh, you know, movement. It's, you know, this is where you find a lot of capitalistic ideas, a lot of capitalism, uh, a lot of the, the Wall Street guys that, you know, had the financial crisis several years ago were probably Graves Five mentality people where they just felt like they could keep going on these these paths of, of growing their businesses with no effect. There's no ecology thought to the to how things might collapse financially for them. They just figured, oh, this is limitless. We just keep going after this money, keep building this. Even though it's built on a house of cards, uh, we don't really see that clearly. We're gaming the Grave 4 system, and we've emerged Graves 5 as the leaders of this. It, it's not just greedy capitalist pigs, though. Correct. I don't want to paint that picture yet. Yeah. Really, we nicknamed Graves 5 the achievement level. And it's really anybody who's in a... I mean, that's definitely a piece of it, right? Like, one of the most glaring examples of the Graves 5 is the, you know, the... the the bankers who were at the top who were like, you know, exploiting every loophole. Definitely, that's a Graves 5 representation. But it's really anybody who's going through any massive achievement, thinking yeah. that, you know, there's no reason to hold themselves back. And this is a very important level. Um, you know, just like we talked about, we're learning lessons at every level. At one, we learn how to survive. At two, we understand un unconditional acceptance. At three, we learn how to put a stake in the ground and stand up for ourselves. And at four, we learn how to identify with something bigger than us, right? We learn how to identify with an institution or something bigger than just us. You know, our we put a stake in the ground for a concept, an ideology. At five, we learn that there's no reason to limit ourselves, right? Why are we living a limitation, a limited life? Why not go for what we want on a bigger scale? Let's put a man on the moon Let's by 1969. It. That's right. There's no reason to limit ourselves. And so Graves 5 is a is a absolutely necessary level absolutely. For, hum for humanity. And if you notice, we go back to an odd, which is about me. It's about my achievement, right? It's about me figuring out how to get my, um, you know, how to gain all this resource, which is, as far as I'm concerned, limitless. So five is a fantastic level for understanding that there's really no reason to manufacture limitation. As a Graves 4, if someone's a Graves 4, though, and they look at Graves 5, they're going to see those clear examples of the business, and they might think, well, that's what that level is. That seems icky to me. I never want to go there. Mm -hmm. I want to limit myself because I never want to grow to that level because I don't want to be one of those kind of people. There are other ways to achieve than that, obviously. And there's, you know, society, like I said, sent a man to the moon. The whole country rallied behind that in the 1960s. Our, our United States rallied behind that idea. So did Russia. And it was this idea of achieving something beyond just yourself, you know, as just your society. Achievement, movement forward. This can happen in religion, politics, uh, education. I mean, all sorts of ways that things can be improved upon. Oh, that's such a great point. I've seen so many people keep themselves from going to Graves 5 because they think that making money is icky. Right? Like achievement at all for some reason. Yeah, like there, it's wrong. You know, you're supposed to stay in your current level and stay, you know, true to your ideology. And so they do manufacture limitation, right? They, they synthetically create limitation around themselves when there's no limitation there. That's just a perspective. Um, there are lots of, like you said, there's lots of ways to go to Graves 5. Anybody who's gone to the Olympics and won a gold medal, they were at 5, right? So there's lots of reasons to go to 5 that have nothing to do with money. However... Money is just a tool. It's just a resource. And money mastery through five is a really fantastic way to graduate to the next level of six. Yeah. <laughs> so now what happens, just like when all those threes got together, right, and they kind of like were sort of at each other's throat, and then they sort of created a relationship with each other and said, okay, we're going to create territory boundaries. 
it's it's really a group of threes that get together that uh, end up in four. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with two, right? A group of ones wander in together and they start getting a bigger and bigger group and suddenly they're not graves too. The same thing happens with five going to six. When you've got successful fives, people who have achieved, who have maybe gotten their financial goals met or whatever their goal was, and they've run into other high achievers, right? They're not just running into fours, which look to them for leadership, but they're running into other fives. And they're like, oh, you achieved what you wanted to too, right? What ends up happening is fives go, okay, so now what, right? We achieved all this. Maybe I made, as I, uh, there are some people who have made more money than they could possibly ever spend in a lifetime. So now they're like, okay, so what do I do? Now what do I do, right? Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates is a great example of this, right? They make more money than any one person could possibly spend in a lifetime. So what are they doing right now? Are they drinking Mai Tais on the beach, right? Are they going into work every day and just focusing on making even more money no. for some reason? No. What did they do? they went to a more ecological perspective. They started to see outside of themselves and just their achievement, and they started to see the impact that we have on the world. And that's what happens when you achieve. You graduate to grave six. Six is, the color is green, and we call it the ecological level or the ecology level. And this is when we take in even more territory. We start to see things not just in terms of me, my survival, our survival, what I can get resource wise, or maybe what we could create infrastructurally. It's not just about, you know, spotting all the loopholes to, you know, make as much resource as you can, but it's like, how are we impacting the world? Yeah. Right. What impact am I having on the community of the entire globe? And you can see that with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, right? They're fighting disease in Africa. They don't have to do that. There's no reason. I mean, there, there's reason to do that, but there's no reason that anybody's put on them individually. Nobody said, okay, now that you've made a lot of money, now you have to go give it back, right? They're just doing that. And that's what happen at, ha- happens at six. Six starts to take in a much bigger territory. And this is when we see people who maybe were once like strong business leaders turning to maybe, um, you know, personal development groups. Or they start to go on a journey to discover themselves. Uh, they start to ask, you know, how can I turn my multi million dollar company into a green company, right? Mm. They really start to think in terms of community and giving back to the world. And that's what six is. Six is all about ecology. Now, when fives looks at, look at sixes, a lot of times fives are still in kind of a scientific mode because science was actually birthed in, well, not science was birthed in four, but science is very much the province of five. Science and technology is very important for five. Very important for five. And they'll look at sixes and they'll go, why do they care so much about like, you know, why do they care so much about like GMOs? And why do they care so much about like, you know, like foods that are, you know, not scientifically grown or whatever. Why do they care about like a lot of fours will look at sixes and be like, oh, they're just making up global warming, right? Um, it's really interesting that sixes, even though they're they're pretty much birthed, I would say that sixes, excuse me, grave six probably was birthed around 20 to 50 years ago. The human potential movement was probably the first of us really dipping our toes into this. And not to say that nobody reached six before, right? Like, like people, individuals could have potentially reached any of these levels, but we're talking about when it shows up on a macro level, when entire societies start moving into this. And now that we've seen this, now we see like whole foods coming up. Um, we see nutrition becoming a big deal for people. Um, we see, you know, recycling popping up all over the place, even in tiny little towns where nobody really cares. You'll still see recycling centers, you know, popping up. So this is really the sign of Grave Six super emerging in our culture. I would say uh, tackling global warming is kind of a Grave Six idea that, yeah, we might be okay in our country, but, you know, like as a global community, as a world, we need to think about how what every country, what every what every industry is doing on the planet is going to impact all of us. It's kind of this egalitarian view of everyone on the planet. And we've got to get a handle of this as a, as a complete planet, not just us in our country. We've got to kind of work together with people. Um, I just want to mention a little bit more about resource. If at four resource is scarce and at five resources are limitless, sixes start to see resource no longer as limitless, but they do start to see resource as abundant. Uh, so it's there. You can use up a resource, but there is abundance, and there is enough for everyone if we can create the distribution structures and create a world in where everyone has access to the resource that they need. That is possible. So it's not limitless. We can actually deforest the entire world if we keep cutting down trees. <laughs> right. But there is enough resource to go around, and it is abundant. 
if we're careful and we think in an ecological manner. So this totally. really shifts in how you see resource again. Absolutely. That is such a great way of describing sixes, that they don't see resources limitless, but they do see it as abundant. And I just want to make a comment. It's so funny, the global warming issue. Um, you and I had this conversation not that long ago. We're like, okay, so global warming. What? Let's say it's not man-made, right? Let's say it's just climate change. What does that matter? Why shouldn't we recycle anyway? Yeah, why not? Why not treat <laughs> why not? this resource of the planet <laughs> kindly? And you can see that there's a real backlash against this whole concept from fours, fives to some extent, but especially fours. Fours hate the concept of global warming and climate change. And one of the reasons why is because laws might get made that they don't like, right? Because yeah. they're always thinking in terms of laws and rules. Sixes have kind of gone beyond laws and rules. In fact, six. One of the things about you can tell that somebody's gone into six is they stop caring what the laws and rules of their country are to some extent, right? They're like, yeah, but that law or rule is stupid, so I'm just not going to listen to it. I'm just not going to care. And so sixes kind of get this global perspective where they're not as concerned with the laws and the rules of the country. They're more concerned with the impact that things are having on a holistic level. Yeah. And so that's six. Well, there's one more level that I want to talk about in this podcast. And that is just like with the standout twos, you got threes. And the standout fours, you get fives. When you have standout sixes, you graduate up to seven. Now, one of the things that you learn in six, all right? So we just talked about all of the different rules you learn. Fives are like, why, why limit ourselves, right? Like, why don't we just go for it? What sixes learn is they learn to give back. They learn reciprocity. They learn community. They learn that it's not just about them, that they have impact. Well, uh, one of the problems that six faces, though, right? And this is one of the reasons why six is by no means the end of this level, these levels of development, is that sixes start to see everybody as having a voice, right? They see everything, like they should take everybody's voice into consideration. There's no more need to be dogmatic. They're, they really are concerned with how everybody is impacted. So they want everybody to be honored. It's the idea of tolerance kind of emerges here. Totally. We need to be tolerant of everybody's viewpoint, no matter what it is. You know, those coexist bumper stickers that have all the religious symbols on it. Yeah. It's a very grave six concept, regardless of whether or not the person driving is grave six, that's a grave six bumper sticker. And, um, that's great and fantastic. And that's a wonderful lesson to learn in grave six. However, one of the problems is that if you're busy listening to everybody's perspective, it becomes really difficult to, to make one particular mission your mission. And that's the thing that you're going to change the world with. Um, you understand the concept of impact and you want to give back, but you might have difficulty actually implementing anything because everything is okay. Uh, one of the best examples of this is burning man. Uh, Burning Man is a 20,000 person city that gets made up overnight and it lasts for about a week and a half, week to week and a half. And it's filled with grave sixes. It's basically an art festival. And one of the big problems they have, because now it's gotten so big and so many people want to go over here, is that they every year are changing up how they're selling their tickets and they can't settle on one particular way of selling their tickets because they're trying to be totally fair. Yeah. And it's just not working out. It's just too bloated, right? Like there's too much going on and they're just struggling to figure out a way um, to do ticket sales that make it so that everybody, it, like it's fair. And there was a lottery that went on one year and there was like, I mean, it's just, they're just really struggling. Well, what happens with grave seven when they grow, when a standout six really starts to, um, you know, sort of shine amongst this community is they graduate to grave seven, which we call thought leader. And that is a person who has learned the lessons of six, but has realized that not every voice needs to be given the exact same honor, that there are certain voices that are less honorable than others. And they are more in a position of mission, like really like kind of being that leader for a mission because they have determined that, yeah, there's better and worse perspectives com to come from. There are some things that we just can't tolerate. Um, tolerance is a great lesson and there's some things that can't be tolerated. And so sevens, uh, the, the color is turquoise. Sevens really get to this point of, um, or, or, oh, excuse me, sevens are yellow. Uh, eight is turquoise, but I'm not even going to talk about eight. <laughs> Sevens are yellow. Thank you. And there's this concept of, um, yeah, let's get it done. 
Like, let, let's actually have mission. Let, we need to make the tough choices. We need to make difficult choices. And one of the markers of a seven is that they'll meet anybody at a previous level at their level. Sometimes you can't even tell when you're talking to a seven because they're talking to fours like they're four and they're talking to fives like they're five. They become chameleons for all these levels because they recognize that they need to get something done and they can't spend their time or waste their time pretending to or being in their the level that is not going to get it done. So um, one of the things about sevens is that it's just emerging now, right? Like maybe maybe within the last 20 years, we've seen sevens pop up. It is a very, very small percentage of the population. In fact, I don't really know any sevens. Hmm. I maybe know like one or two. And I'm in a group of lots of sixes. <laughs> I know lots and lots and lots of sixes. And even sixes are pretty rare, right? I would say that in the United States, we've got a smattering of twos and threes. We've got maybe 50% of the population, 45% of the population that's grades four still. We've got a big percentage that's grades five, probably about 35 to 40%. And then we've got maybe about a 20 per, may, um, I think we're hitting a tipping point. I could see us moving up to 17.5 to 20% of grave sixes. I mean, fives are definitely taking notice. They're like, they're building entire businesses around, you know, I mean, what, how many things that you, do you see now that says organic or say organic on them? Why do they do that? They do that for the sixes. And so there's definitely a movement of sixes that's growing and getting bigger and bigger because the fives are definitely starting to market to them and taking note. But sevens, very small. If you think you're a seven, you're not. All right, most likely. <laughs> All right, I don't want to say that universally, but most people who think they're sevens are not. That's another thing. If you're trying to type yourself in this system, most people give themselves a two-level bump. So if you think you're six, you might be four. If you think you're seven, you might be five. Yeah. <laughs> that's not uncommon. Not 100%, but that's that's an, that's not uncommon for people to give themselves a two-level bump. Especially when you're first learning the system. The other thing that I think is in, like kind of a key to point out here, when you move from five into six, you begin to see things not in terms of cause and effect. I think five and, and lower levels begin, you know, they think you do one action over here and it causes an action here. A equals B. And when you move into six, you begin to understand that everything is an emergent of a system. So you start to be seeing some systems thinking emerge here. And you start to kind of understand the ecology. We talked about this, the ecological level at six. You start to understand how, oh, I see if I dump sewage into this stream up here, the village down the, you know, the, the city down the stream is going to have to deal with my sewage down there. So you start thinking in like, streams of flow of like systems thinking if i dump something in the mississippi river in the united states it's going to end up in new orleans down the river right and and i fours and fives see this as well but sixes start to see this on a really high level they understand that things are not cause and effect but their emergence of systems so they they kind of get that they understand it but i think when you get into level seven you begin to have mastery over that so you begin to go into and into a system and you begin to tweak its components to be able to create a different emergent in that system. So you understand how all the parts are interplaying to such a degree. And I think you kind of alluded to this, how they can talk to people at different levels. They're understanding the interplay between systems and starting to put these together and be able to actually manipulate them directly. Yeah, I, I want to mention two things about the system before we wrap it up, because I think at seven, that's it. I mean, there's obviously we're going to be, who knows where the end is, right? Like eight, nine, ten, that's coming down the pike. We don't even know what that looks like yet. I know somebody who claimed to be an eight, but I'm I'm dubious. Um, now, I, I would put myself as a six. So if somebody's a seven or eight, I haven't been there yet. So I could be totally wrong when I say that I don't know many, any sevens. How would I know? Because I'm not there yet, right? Um, but that said... There's a couple of things about this system that I really want to focus in on before we close close the loop on sure. this. The first one is that every transition from one level to the next on a macro level has been bloody. We're talking war, right? When, when groups and tribes go from graves two to three, it almost always ends in war. When they go from three to four, war. When they go from five, four to five, war. Okay, so we see blood spilled on a macro level when societies go from one one or the leadership rather i should say the leadership of that group goes from one graves level to the next and that's what happens on a micro level like you might not actually be bleeding physically but it it, it causes some trauma to go from one level to the next so we tend to avoid it unless we're pushed there um there's two main reasons why we go to the next level we go to the next level number one when when the problems we're facing cannot be solved by our current level. 
So we're forced to go to the next level. Um, you see this with like little kids who are in broken families. Uh, that their grades two experience is really distressing and there's a lot of trauma there. You'll see them go up to three real quick, right? You'll see them become little warlords like at seven years old because two just isn't cutting for him. So we see people going to the next level in times of trauma. We also see people going to the next level when they have fully explored their current level and then they're just really not sure what else to do. Right? So like the Bill Gates of the world fully explored five and then went, okay, now what? So going up the stages of development, I mean, you don't have to, you can land very comfortably in whatever level that, that suits you. And that's perfectly acceptable. There's no ethical imperative to continue to go up the levels. However, the more we go up the levels, right? The more we see things get done on the planet, the less warfare we see on a, on a global level. Um, the more we see people, uh, I mean, when we go from five to six, right, we're going right now, it's quote unquote bloody politically, right? We see lots of like anger and lots of, um, you know, political, uh, factions being created around this. And people don't like that. Some people are going to six and they're still fours or fives or whatever. So we see a lot of agitation, but this is the first time we haven't seen all that war. And yeah. that's amazing. That is amazing. The more levels we go up as an individuals and as societies, the less blood we see shed, which is incredible. So that's one huge plug for going up the levels. And the second thing that I wanted to mention is that um, we as individuals, uh, we have a lot to gain by going up these levels um, and not stalling out. We have a lot, there's a lot of sort of personal satisfaction that happens when we go up these levels, even though it causes trauma during the transition. The truth is, is that our worlds open up more and more. Our consciousness opens up. We see a bigger picture. We take in more territory. And my observation has been that the people who say get to six are generally happier than the people who stay at four. Hmm. Yeah, I can, I can vouch for that too. I think that growth, I believe if it's true growth and it's like proactive growth, I believe does lead to happiness. And I, you know, I'll borrow whatever your, you know, your country is. The United States, we have a document, uh, the Declaration of Independence that says something, you know, every person in this country is given the right to life, liberty, and there's a particular phrase, the pursuit of happiness. And I believe that pursuit, that word pursuit, really keys into that idea that people are happier when they're growing, when they're looking to proactively move forward in some way, that that movement and increasing their, uh, their ability to deal with the world, increasing their perspective, increasing their consciousness. From my perspective, from my experience, and I think yours as well, and I think probably if you're listening, this has been your case too, when you proactively grow, it does lead to happiness. You can increase your happiness through growth. And so I think what you said is absolutely true. Yeah. So um, if you're interested in the Graves model, I just want to give a little plug for a program that we put on called Your Personality, the Owner's Manual. And we talk about understanding where you're at uh, in the Graves model as being part of your roadmap to getting to where you want to go. So if you're interested in the Graves model and kind of understanding where you fit and the implications of that in your life and getting to the place where you really want to get to, um, I would recommend checking out owners, the Owner's Manual program. Um, there's a lot of really good stuff in there. It talks about other models, Myers-Briggs, et cetera. But this is one that we really sp spend some time focusing on. And, uh, and it does help create a map for getting to the next level. Absolutely. We want to hear from you. Again, an emerging community of people of like minds just like you are over at personalityhacker.com. Make a comment on this podcast. Ask a question. We want to interact with you. We want to find out who you are and be a part of this community with you and co-create this experience, this amazing experience of moving through life together and growing together. You can also find us on facebook.com forward slash personality hacker, twitter.com forward slash personality hack. And uh, my name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. Thanks for joining us on The Graves Model. We will talk to you on the next podcast. Mm -hmm.